Hello, and welcome to the latest expert series webinar. Today's webinar is ETF Evolution, Emergence of Non-Traditional Indexing. This is a complimentary ETF.com webinar courtesy of Northern Trust Management. I'm Ollie Ludwig, the managing editor of ETF.com. We are the leading authority on news and data about ETFs and the company behind Inside ETFs, the world's biggest ETF conference. Joining me today is Chandran Thomas. Chandran serves as the head of the FlexShares brand of ETFs at Northern Trust, and he's the head of all funds and managed accounts operations at FlexShares parent, Northern Trust Asset Management. Before we get started, I'd like everyone to know that uh, you can ask questions at any time during the webinar in the window at the lower right of your screens. I'll probably be, be asking Chandran a few questions uh, along the way, but there will be a Q&A afterwards. And also bear in mind that the deck of slides will be available to all of you by early next week. Indexing is clearly shifting gears since Vanguard launched the first retail index fund in the mid-1970s. While the capitalization-weighted indexing methodology of that first Vanguard S&P 500 fund remains popular these days, and cap-weighted indexing continues to attract investor dollars, a host of other indexing approaches have begun to interest more and more investors and advisors these days. Exchange-traded funds, which are for the most part marketed as index funds, have been the main beneficiary of this rise of popularity in indexing. So it's no surprise that ETFs are the main vehicle chosen to deliver these new index approaches, which are variously described as smart beta, enhanced beta, or as FlexShares is calling it, non-traditional indexing. And I quite like that term, which we'll get into more in this webinar. Northern Trust FlexShares ETF unit launched its first funds in the autumn of 2011, and the firm is clearly betting that non-traditional indexing will be one of the more vibrant pockets of the investment markets in the coming years. FlexShares now has 15 ETFs on the market and almost $9 billion in ETF assets under management. And it just put another fund into registration. That, appropriately enough, is a non-traditional indexing strategy focused on fixed income. Virtually all of its funds canvass the investment universe in different ways, whether that means tilting portfolios towards various investment factors such as dividends or quality, or simply targeting swaths of the investment universe in fresh ways, as is the case with GUNR, its biggest strategy, which accesses global infrastructure companies in both the developed world and the emerging markets. In all, more than $200 billion of U.S. ETF assets are now benchmarked to so-called smart beta indexes, including fundamentally weighted indexes. Investors have been sobered by two, bull mar uh, two bear markets in the first decade of the 21st century, and they've become much more conscious of fund fees, as well as the questionable track records of all but a handful of active mutual fund strategies. But they're still looking for superior investment performance, and that's where this non-traditional indexing movement gets much of its impetus. So FlexShares has successfully jumped into the fray, joining various companies like Wisdom Tree, PowerShares. But crucially, FlexShares is doing this in its very own way, and I think the term non-traditional indexing that FlexShares favors reflects the company's varied approach to bringing new product to market. So there are a lot of products competing for investor assets now, and advisors had better become more discerning to make the right choices. Chandran plans to shine a light on what these non-traditional indexes are seeking to isolate and how the ETF company he heads is staking its claim in this vibrant pocket in the world of investment. So let's welcome Chandran Thomas, the head of FlexShares ETF brand, to talk about the world of indexing, how it's shifting gears, and how his company is making sure it's in the middle of that traffic. Chandran? Ali, thank you. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity uh, to talk to all of the uh, interested parties, uh, and especially uh, advisors or investors, uh, who, like us, are delivering uh, these products uh, for use uh, to the benefit of investing clients. Uh, if I might, where I'd like to start, Ali, is just talking about uh, some of the key trends in two contexts. Uh, because what we always start with when we're thinking about what we want to do 
uh, and delivering uh, good investment strategies and solutions to the marketplace is, is really having uh, an underpinning of what's going on uh, both to our targeted clients, so, so start with talking about advisors, and, and I think that's really meaningful. Uh, the first thing I would note is the increased emphasis that we see on what we would describe as uh, real-world investor goals. Now, this is not necessarily new from the standpoint, if you think about uh, what many uh, advisors do, both on the individual and institutional side in terms of planning, uh, but what I think you've seen it move to today is the influence has had on every part of the engagement with cl clients, so moving from just conceptual things and planning to really thinking about the portfolio construction. Uh, we could say on the institutional side, uh, whether you're thinking about how you have to manage pension liabilities and that specific outcome there, uh, we can think about with individuals uh, moving uh, from an environment where we just think about investments relative to some sort of benchmark to really thinking about specific goals or objectives. Uh, and you've seen that even with some of the packaged products that have evolved. Uh, certainly the investment decision making is shifting generations. And I think we're only beginning to appreciate what the implications for that will mean. Uh, one of the ways I, 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 I like to describe it is if you think about the boomer generation, which is, you know, legging increasingly into retirement and their spending age, uh, spending age, you know, they really, in terms of their engagement with advisors, you know, they're asking you, the advisor. Uh, but when you think about Gen X, um, decidedly pragmatic, uh, they tend to ask themselves. They do a lot of investigation beforehand and, and online and different resources like that. And then even gen Generation Y being yet even different, using social media, connecting in different ways, they ask their friends. And all these will have very real implications, and they're already starting to have implications on the way that we think about and we deliver investment solutions to these clients. Uh, the continued shift uh, from active to, to passive investment strategies I think is important because I think we've moved past the point where we just talk about that as some sort of cyclical move, but we certainly know by virtue of various things that we have seen a secular shift. I think if you look at the total assets uh, now uh, uh, specifically in the global market and in the U.S. market, you know, you look at index strategies making up somewhere in the neighborhood about 22% of that share. I mean, that's up um, within less than 10 years from being closer to 9%. So I think that's uh, important, uh, and your comments noted how it is particularly impacting uh, certain vehicles of choice, uh, uh, especially being ETFs. Um, I think something that's also important is the growing acceptance and the utilization of technology. We're just seeing that in some respects. But the reason I think that matters is because if you're going to deliver uh, solutions more through a technology basis, what that means is, you have to have increased transparency, uh, simplicity, or accessibility to those investment solutions. So that affects the way that we think about that, and that's how we, we start with the lens and thinking about the end client uh, when we're delivering solutions. When you think about the trends for the industry, um, clearly we have seen an, evol of, of an evolution away squarely from established benchmarks. Uh, and when I say that, it doesn't mean that there's not a lot of emphasis on traditional strategies. That plays a huge role in portfolios, and it will continue to. Uh, but where we've seen what I would call the third wave of innovation, so if you started with what I would say broad-based traditional equity strategies, the second wave moving to more asset classes, this third wave certainly has been, uh, I would say, characterized uh, by this move towards more enhanced indices or fundamental factors. Uh, and that's obviously uh, one of the things that we're talking about today. It depends on who's counting the pennies, but you see directionally the same sort of things. I know Cogent was recently out with their research that says, you know, 29% of uh, last year's flows uh, went to what they define as smart uh, beta uh, ETFs. Uh, you saw a similar study out of Morningstar that said 31% of 2013 flows went to strategic beta. Uh, I know all of you guys do a lot of research, and you have similar type of uh, accounting for it. But the point is uh, that trend uh, we see clearly in, space, in, in place. Uh, the increased user acceptance of ETFs by financial intermediaries and advisors is significant. Uh, and you see the growth not only in the use of the individual strategies, but if you think about the tremendous growth in managed portfolios, and I see this in another part of the business that I'm responsible for, so whether it be through uh, the channel of ETF strategists or, or the like, uh, we are seeing that create even more demand uh, and, again, the ease of which people can employ this vehicle and those strategies is also increasing the acceptance of the vehicles overall. Uh, competition is clearly uh, driving down management fees and execution costs. Uh, certainly, if you're an investor, uh, that matters a lot. I, I think it's not just from the investor standpoint. Clearly, uh, our clients, more than not, are the intermediaries or the advisors. Uh, 
and in their fiduciary role, they have to be thoughtful about the cost of what they're delivering to their end investors. Uh, so what that does is it does create pricing pressure and, and it reduces the cost of the various different fund vehicles, not just something in ETF, but if you think about the implications that that has for substitute vehicles, uh, including things like mutual funds, uh, we see that coming across the industry. And then uh, one of the things that we looked at from the time when we were starting the business, uh, we, we certainly uh, saw a shift or what we believe was a, a growing shift in terms of the thoughts institutions had in terms of how they use ETFs. Uh, so institutions, in most respects, were really the first users, but uh, the usage being more in hedging and interim type strategies like cash equitization. But you clearly see a move today where a lot of the utilization of ETFs among institutions where it's growing is really in core portfolio use, a clear uh, holding of their portfolio. Uh, you probably saw many of the surveys that are out that talk about just the extended holding period times of institutions uh, in terms of ETFs. I, I think on, for many institutions that exceeds two years now. Uh, so it shows you again uh, that they're using it for long-term exposure. So those are the things that really underpin what we think about, Ali, in terms of, uh, of key trends. Uh, quick question, uh, Chandran, before you uh, push sure. onward. Um, this generational uh, inflection point that you touched on briefly there, do you see it? with regards to uh, the advisor population uh, in addition to the investor population? And what, what I mean to say is, is it, is it demonstrable to you that, let's say, slightly younger advisors are absolutely receptive to the ETF more than, say, uh, older ones are? Is, is, that, is that a trend that you're looking at and wondering how to leverage, or, or is that uh, off the mark? So what's interesting is you don't see that. So what I would say is one of the trends in the marketplace or one of the interesting observations is um, with respect to advisors, the aging of the advisor base. So you're not necessarily seeing a lot of newer or younger or as much fresh advisors come into the uh, space. Uh, so in a sense, the replacement uh, of value is low. Um, so actually, you're seeing the actual investors or the customer base change faster. The demographics there are changing faster than the advisor base. I think advisors actually are really keen to that. And what you see is thoughtful advisors really thinking about that thinking about how they serve the different demographics that they have. Um, I was looking at some research by the ICI, for instance, and one of the things it was talking about, not bad or good, but if you just look at different types of fund vehicles, they were giving the demographics of mutual fund users versus ETF users. So you find that, uh, uh, that the net worth of an ETF user is about two and a half times that of a mutual fund. They tend to be younger and higher educated. None of those things are bad or good. They're just different. And so those are things that I think as advisors deliver strategies and they think about demographics, they have to account for. Thank you. So another thing we think about is, you know, what are the spectrum of investment strategies that you have in the marketplace? Certainly you could characterize it in a number of different ways, but we see sort of a span, everything from if you think about, say, traditional beta, so think about cap-weighted uh, uh, index products, again, that make up a big percentage of products that are out there today. Uh, alternative beta, we think of that as just sort of thinking about alternatively weighted index products. Um, you move there to what we would describe as engineered solutions, and that's more kind of the category of we, we think about things that we do um, sort of driven by either fundamental or factor or multi-factor uh, type uh, strategies. You've got traditional alpha, which we'd be familiar with in the context of, say, security selection. And then think about alternative alpha. Um, you have low correlation to beta, um, sort of traditional alternative classes. And when I say alternative, I mean alternative to equities and fixed income. Um, and they might employ leverage. So across that continuum, uh, we're seeing that uh, even vehicles like the exchange-traded fund vehicle, uh, you see people leveraging that vehicle uh, across um, sort of different parts of the investment strategies. And we see advisors just being coming more facile in terms of how they want to use these different types of strategies and the different vehicles in their portfolios. Now, the other thing that we think is interesting, and this gets to how we think about sort of developing strategies and products, but I think importantly how anyone on the call uh, would think about the, 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 op the responsibility we have for, for building effective uh, investment portfolios. So, and this, and this speaks to why you have, uh, I think, an increase of some of these non-traditional approaches and strategies. Uh, and, and it's, one, managing biases, which is very important, uh, risk and cost. One of the things um, uh, that, that, that I like to, to, to step back and think about is we're all hopelessly biased. 
Uh, and so how do we make sure we have a process that, that sort of accounts for those? The, the three most common that we see from an investment standpoint or investor standpoint is related to the three Cs, concentration, compensation, and cost, right? So you see oftentimes we, we fail to really get appropriately or fail to appropriately mitigate concentrated risk exposure. And, and, and what I mean by that might not be obvious. If you think about getting exposure to different risk factors, it could be any number of risk factors. It could be size. It could be value. It could be things like that. We can get it through an index-based strategy. We can get it through an active strategy. Uh, it, it has tended to be the case when you have a lot of core and satellite approaches. You know, people may say, I'm just going to, uh, you know, have all traditional strategies or traditional index or, or beta strategy in the core, and I'll take risk in the satellite. One interesting thing about that is by definition what you're doing is concentrating your risk exposure in those satellites. And so one of the things that we think about is, is it more optimal or efficient to think about how I might take that risk across my portfolio? Uh, that's, you know, that's just an inherent bias we have in building portfolios that we try to think about offsetting. Uh, another uh, risk uh, or bias that we think about is just a failure to get a, appropriately compensated for what we describe as specific risks. So our construct is you've got specific risks like, you know, duration, credit risk, equity risk, uh, and those you should be getting compensated for. So the question is not are you taking risk, is what are you getting paid for it. You know, Ali, if you contrast that to something like inflation or concentration risk, we would refer to that as a composite risk. We really want to hedge or mitigate that in portfolios. And so, again, when we're designing the strategies, again, uh, in a non-traditional index approach, we can actually build things into the approach that help to offset some of these uh, biases or improve uh, the risk-adjusted returns. And then the last one is, you know, failure to adequately account for uh, all costs. So we consciously think a lot about explicit costs, like the management fee and the transaction costs. But do we think as intimately as we should about implicit costs like cash drag, taxation, uh, where, where it applies, but just as importantly, opportunity costs the fact that you chose one investment strategy versus another that was readily available. And so that's where it comes down to, at least for us and other people, uh, have probably, you know, they have their own approaches, but what we call flexible indexing. And in a sense, it lives between what, you know, you would think of as traditional uh, index management and traditional a active management. Uh, we're taking a very active engagement uh, to the actual design of the index, but we're not starting with an index. We are actually starting with uh, whatever the concept is that we have in mind, and even before that, what we would say is the fundamental objective. Uh, so in our case, what we do is we have a, a simple framework that says, hey, there, there, there are really four fundamental objectives that all investors have. You know, they want to grow their assets. They want to manage certain risks. Uh, they need to have liquidity uh, provided by their portfolio, and, and at different times and at different levels, uh, they need to generate income. So actually, when we think about designing a strategy, we don't think about uh, what kind of uh, you know asset class we're looking at first or what have you. We actually think about what kind of investor objection, objective are we trying to solve for. And I think one of the, the distinctive things about our approach is we we – take ownership in every part of the process. So we start with that objective. Uh, we're, we're conceiving the strategy and thinking about how that works, so we're testing it and doing our own research. Uh, we engage with index providers. So whether we partner with an outside provider, and we've had the, the, the pleasure of working with folks like Morningstar or iBox or others or Stocks, um, or we work with an, our affiliated advisor. So in a part of Northern Trust, we have an index services group. Uh, we're really collaborating on that uh, index uh, such that it delivers. Uh, we know that the index we will get from the provider will deliver against that uh, investor objective. And again, we go all the way through the process of developing the fund to managing the fund uh, with the thought process being that we really can uh, speak to the persistence of the strategy, the confidence that we have that it can be delivered in the way that it should and give the exposures that we want. Uh, and so that's one of the things that, uh, again, we, we call out as distinctive about the approach. I won't cover this in detail, but I think it is important that if you're engaged in this in any part of the value chain when ultimately we're delivering uh, investment solutions to end investors, uh, we ought to be able to talk about not only sort of our products, but we ought to be able to talk about our practice and from our standpoint our principles. 
So these are the things uh, that undergird how we, we really look at it. You know, again, I mentioned focusing on those fundamental investor objectives. That's the lens at which we come through it and how we develop these strategies. Really having a process that's constantly undergirded by empirical research. So we focus on that a lot. Uh, you know, we evaluate the investment strategies in a portfolio context. Uh, I think that's important to think about not just what the isolated strategy does, but understanding that any time that you deliver an investment strategy or a product, you are, for the most part, delivering into an, an overall portfolio. So how will the risk of that strategy be measured? How transparency is it? transparent is it? How, in a sense, does it play with the other uh, uh, the kids in the sandbox? And so um, those are things that we think about uh, when we're del delivering the strategies. And, and it goes all the way through. Uh, the arc of doing things like considering the cost. You can, in the construct of your index, consider different costs. So, for example, um, if you're thinking about what the, the tradability of uh, the actual ultimate strategy would be, uh, you have to think about the liquidity of the underlying. So we certainly have certain rules in the strategies that would rule out sort of illiquid securities and different things like that. So all those are conscious considerations of the design of the index and the ultimate delivery of the product in the management of the product, uh, and it goes finally through the end to constantly monitoring and measuring it. So, so even though it's an index strategy and it's rules-based and we want consistency over time, uh, you always have to challenge and test your assumptions. So monitoring it in a way not to just say, did we get good performance? But the better question is, did we deliver what we promised? And so that's kind of, you know, the way we sort of think about it. You know, I end with just some thoughts on you know, how do these come into play? And then, you know, we'd love to take questions. But uh, I'd give some examples of these sort of non-traditional index approaches. You know, can, run, can, can I jump in really quick? I just wanted to ask you before you, before you, 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 you uh, finish up here. When you choose to hire an, an external index provider or turn internally to the indexing unit within a Northern Trust, um, I'm not totally clear. If you're doing it at all, why not do it entirely? Aren't you saving costs by going internally? What, what are some of the considerations that would make you think that an external provider can do the job better than you if you have a pretty clear idea of what your overall strategy is with regards to uh, product demand and product development? Yeah, so I would say uh, it, that presupposes or it depends on what your driver is. So, so our driver always is how do we deliver um, the best outcome, right? And so... The, the practical reality is we do have at Northern Trust a lot of intellectual capital. There are places where uh, we believe uh, the organization, uh, so if you think about, for instance, what we did with, with, the, with the, the quality series of products that we have. Um, alternatively, if we're focusing on something where we, we fundamentally know and we look at it totally objectively, that somebody from the marketplace has a lot of insight and the engagement on that has the potential of delivering to us a better outcome or product, I mean, that's the bar that you have to chin. So, 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 so for us, we literally come to the process saying we're, we're going to be objective uh, in terms of who's going to be able to be the right partner on a particular index. Um, and it's interesting, not that it was by design, but if you look at it, you mean it's kind of, it breaks out half and half in terms of our portfolio today in terms of how many of them are affiliated and outside. Um, but again, it wasn't by design. It was just by following our nose as we did the research and we looked at the strategies. Got it. Appreciate it. And, um, and, you know, I can, like I said, if we were talking about specific instances, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I could, you know, call out, like, why that is. So, for example, you know, um, when we think about that um, fundamental objective of growing our assets or, or capital appreciation, you know, one of the things uh, that was uh, of, of, of great interest to us uh, is looking at how could we deliver a broad-based uh, product uh, but maybe capture some of the premia that's in the marketplace in, in, in very known and understood factors like size and value. So here uh, was an opportunity where there are and there exist many options in the market to give you core equity exposure in the portfolio. Those options extend anywhere from traditional index op uh, options to, quite frankly, most uh, options today that are still being used are, are actively managed core uh, portfolios. Uh, from our standpoint, you know, just thinking about the efficiency uh, of using an index strategy and the ability to systematically capture some of the risk premia that's offered, uh, we thought we could deliver an attractive strategy 
um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in an ETF context. So again, that's just thinking about a different way to deliver against a core objective uh, that an investor has. Um, and the fact that we felt like this particular approach lent itself uh, to an index approach, uh, the fact that we could, in doing our research, identify someone in the marketplace, uh, in, the, in, in this case Morningstar, who brought a lot of insights uh, and ability to be able to be able to deliver an index against that. Um, that's the way, if you think about sort of the arc of how you get to these, you know, sort of non-traditional index solutions, how you can partner. Um, but I think the confidence uh, that you can have, and I think it's an important part of the process, is being involved from beginning to end, having the, the strategy um, sort of developed uh, ourselves. Uh, we can really own that when we're going out into the marketplace and then delivering the product. Um, similar thing when we were thinking about, you know, how do you approach uh, risk management? And, and again, a lot of the way that we, we come at it is, you know, we're focusing on the investor. What we would often hear in the marketplace uh, and, and from pro prospective and, and, and existing clients that we had is the desire to get exposure to natural resources um, and or commodities, uh, but they wanted diversified exposure. And so one of the things that we observe very readily is many of the uh, options that were in the marketplace were, say, heavily weighted to, say, energy or a particular commodity. There's nothing inherently bad or good about that. Um, it's just a function of what you want. And so because we believed that and we knew that, that there was demand in the marketplace for sort of a diversified exposure to natural resources, um, that's one of the things uh, that we had in the back of our minds. But again, we also came at that specifically in looking at it in the context of risk. Uh, because where we would current, where we would constantly have the discussion is thinking about natural resources and the benefit that they would provide over extended period of time to offsetting inflation risk in a portfolio. So again, that's where we thought, okay, is there another way to approach it? And you came up with a construct where you have these five different sleeves. You know, we look at energy, we look at commodities, we look at agriculture, but we we're also able to add to that timber and water to have those uh, targeted exposures, uh, to think about how you build that into an index-based strategy and present it in an efficient way. It's just, again, an, 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 an instance where you think about, here's how we can have a different index or rules-based approach that will be effective and efficient for a need in the marketplace. Um, I'll end with one final example, uh, and then I'd like to turn it over back to you for questions, Ali, just thinking about uh, generating income. Uh, because that's certainly been a conversation for uh, the last several years in this persistently low interest rate environment. And again, because we come at it thinking about first, what's the objective? Uh, we didn't limit it to saying it had to be a fixed income uh, uh, portfolio or what have you. We just said, how would we think about generating income in a portfolio? Uh, and we settled on focusing on uh, delivering that through uh, high quality uh, stocks, uh, high quality dividend paying stocks. Uh, so again, um, uh, developing uh, something where you had an intersection of yield and quality. In this particular case, to something that you highlighted, uh, Ali, uh, we have a group uh, in, within our asset management business that has literally years and years of experience working with factor-based strategies. Um, that same competency translates into another part of the business that builds indexes. So this was an opportunity where we could actually leverage uh, the best thinking of Northern Trust to, 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 to deliver an index. But I think it's a very, very relevant question. We expect to be asked, it. how do you make that decision? Again, it was knowing uh, that that was a unique competency, something that we wanted brought to bear in that particular strategy. And so, again, those are just some examples from a portfolio application standpoint uh, about how we go through this process of solving those investor needs and developing these uh, non-traditional index strategies. Great, thank you, Shindran. Uh, so is that, so, uh, that 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 concludes your uh, your prepared comments, uh, and we can get right into Q and A, or or do you want to wrap it up? No, no, I, I want to go right to Q and A. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Chandran. Okay, well, I want to uh, – you've left us a lot of runway. Thank you for that, uh, Chandran. It's great to have uh, time to, to have a, a good Q&A. So I want to remind uh, everyone on the call that um, you can submit any question you want at the lower right of your screen, and we'll, we'll get to you. Um, let me just uh, address a couple of these that came in uh, straight away, uh, Chandran, related to the question I just asked you a couple of minutes ago with regards to uh, – uh, affiliated indexes, uh, so-called uh, uh, self-indexing. Um, 
there was some skepticism as to whether that's appropriate. And this this is not just on this call, but but I hear about it a lot of the journalists traveling in this traffic. Is it how do you how do you respond to objections that maybe there's some kind of purity that is lost in the mix when you do this self-indexing? Um, and a uh, related question that we saw, are there, are there folks who ask about this at all, or, or, or is it uh, not a non-issue from where you sit? Well, it's, cer it's certainly a question um, that we hear in the marketplace. I, I would say we don't get it directly a lot uh, from investors uh, that we deal with. Uh, the way that we think about it is this. So, so certainly, I mean, I, I'm biased, but I don't believe that there is anything inherently wrong with affiliated indexing, uh, uh, I, I think it's quite the opposite. Um, if you th if you think about um, getting exposure in a strategy, uh, my what I would what I like to say is you don't necessarily want to confuse the what with the how. So if I were to play it back to you this way, uh, Ali, I could choose to deliver in a strategy exposure to say size or small capitalization stocks to a traditional uh, uh, alpha approach or a stock picking approach. I could choose to do that through an index based approach. I don't think inherently one of them is inherently better or worse. Now you have to measure the efficacy of that approach, right? So one might turn out to be uh, more better from a risk adjuster standpoint when you, you line them up or things like that, but there is no inherent um, bias that, that, that you would have going into that saying that one is better than the other um, on, on any objective uh, uh, metrics. Uh, continuing that argument, I think that as long as you are transparent in terms of your approach, uh, if people can understand how you're employing uh, the index, why you've chosen it, the methodology as to how that it works, uh, those are all the questions that you should be asking, uh, whether it's an affiliated index or not. Um, so, so no, I, I don't. I don't see that there should be an issue that there. I think the issue comes whether it's affiliated or not. If if you're not answering those questions well, uh, if it's not transparent, if it's not accessible to the investor, uh, if they can't have an appreciation for what you're doing, and if you're not delivering against your value proposition consistently, that absolutely is an issue. Got it. Thank you. Uh, now let's take a real big step back, thirty thousand foot perspective here. Um, and I touched on this a little bit in my uh, introductory comments. Uh, some of the uh, what, what people are calling this phenomenon, what you're calling non-traditional indexing. People have all kinds of different names, and it seems to me that maybe it's because people aren't really clear about how exactly they should be thinking about this. Uh, right. You made it very clear that there's a there's a whole new way. People seem to be receptive to to a new way of looking at benchmarking and at indexes, investable indexes. So what are we talking about in in the broadest terms from your perspective? Uh, you know, is it performance, outperformance? You know, uh, is, it, is, is it better risk adjusted returns? Is it is it is it tactical factor exposure? Give, give us a, a a a big picture kind of way that we can sort of experience everything you're telling us today. Right. And so it's interesting. I mean, if you the way I think about it, if you think about sort of uh, from a historical standpoint, uh, the arc of investment strategies um, uh, through through much of uh, uh, measured time, um, they they would be what we would refer to as you know sort of actively managed strategies. So if we think about indexing in any context, it's an advent of the last fifty years or so, fifty plus years. Um, and my own view is that. In any economic theory and or uh, investment science, it's evolving. And so the thought process that we figured out everything about investing and the most efficient way to do everything 10 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, or 100 years ago, I, I find interesting. I think what we're able to do is as we continue to um, get more of the development in our investment theory and the science behind it, and we get the tools to allow us to utilize that, you would expect it to evolve. So just think about, you know, again, you know, I've talked about this before when we start with our concept of uh, the CAPM and beta being explanatory variable for, say, you know, uh, exposure to market or systemic risk. But we know that we've built on that over time, that we identify other risk factors. And, and, and if you believe those things and if we can come up with uh, strategies over time, to actually take advantage of it, and you can do it in different ways. So again, what we refer to as active in, in investing, in many contexts, a lot of it is just simply giving ourselves exposure to these various factors. 
So I think of it very differently, Ali, because I think we're spending a lot of time sometimes arguing over the how, and I think there are different hows. Now, to then speak specifically to your question on then how would you define it, the reason, you know, we say, you know, non-traditional because we, we do have to try and use some distinction between sort of where we've been or evolved, um, but we don't say that uh, as making a value judgment to suggest one is better than the other. We suggest that it's definitively different. And so I think it's the objective that you're trying to achieve. The last thing I would say, though, is there are more efficient ways to get exposure than others. So I do think expanding the tool set that you use to include other strategies does give you the opportunity in the portfolio to deliver a better risk-adjusted return. That's not an absolute fact. It is an empirical fact. And so that's what I think a lot of people are looking to and trying to achieve when they're building portfolios. Got it. So when we talk about the different names that are uh, out there, uh, smart beta obviously seems to be uh, uh, kind of insinuating itself to front and center, and yet so many people are unhappy with that term. Uh, as I said in my introductory comments, I thought non-traditional indexing is interesting because it does create a big tent and leaves a lot of options open. Um, so does the label matter, and why? Yeah, so I think, or well, here's what I would say. I think lexicon matters. So one of the, uh, the things that, you know, being very exacting uh, that I think about is when we begin to use terms like beta and alpha, they actually mean something, right? And so um, I'm more of a purist than using them in the context that is understood and agreed upon, not in a sense having that sneaky creep to where it becomes more like a marketing convention than the part of a way that we actually have an informed dialogue uh, about in investment uh, practice. So I actually uh, do think it matters. Uh, again, if, if we want to market something in a certain way, I mean, I, I guess I understand that on some level. Uh, we've tried to resist um, uh, mixing those metaphors when we're using what I would call uh, kind of understood and agreed upon investment terms because we don't want to create things that are confusing uh, in the minds of our potential uh, uh, clients and investors. Right. Now, is, is it fair to kind of uh, to, to, to get to get a handle on what's going on here, that, that basically with a non-traditional uh, approach you're, you're trading one set of risks for another and you have to decide what those risks are and, and whether you want to take them on? Uh, I, I'm thinking of things as simple as, you know, uh, SPY, a cap-weighted index of the S&P 500, versus uh, there's a competing product out there that does equal weighting uh, from Guggenheim. Um, and it seems that people don't necessarily think about that clearly. Is that is that is that basically a question of, of trading one set of risks for another and, and thinking about it clearly from there? Well, if I can answer more broadly, not, not in the context of necessarily those two products, but, but I do think it, it does come squarely down to risk, right? So, and in my mind, at the end of the day, you know, investing is about taking risk. And it's not a question of whether or not you're taking risk. It's just, uh, again, are you getting appropriately compensated for it? So, again, when we start talking about some of these risk factors, the biggest one just being the exposure that we have to the market, and we can lever up that exposure to the market or we, or, or we can, uh, uh, you know, uh, deflate our exposure to the market. We can have something more than or less than beta. We can introduce other risk factors, whether it be size or value or momentum or volatility or these things that we have saw over time through empirical research uh, uh, show persistence. Uh, we would add quality to that mix. And now how you do that, um, it depends, right? You, again, you can do that through uh, a traditional active approach. You can do it through what we're defining as this non-traditional approach. I would say uh, the burden of proof should be if there is a promise made that you're delivering that risk exposure, however you're doing it, do you do it and do you do it in an efficient way? And so I think that's what's important. And, and, and Ali, my own view that could be proven wrong is over time, I think you will see more of the marketplace move towards that. Given they have that more outcome orientation, I think we'll actually see a more common way where we invest investment strategies that will diminish some of the emphasis around the how, but people clearly saying, do you actually deliver in a risk-adjusted way what you promise? Got it. Uh, now, I wanted to talk about uh, some of your specific strategies, and, and, and there are 15 of them, as I said earlier, uh, and uh, I wanted to talk about your uh, 
quality dividend suite of products. Uh, they they trade under uh, well. There's there's the the sort of mother index, I suppose. Uh, uh, let's look at the domestic strategies for a moment, okay? And, and and you have international ones as well. But the domestic ones, the Flex Shares Quality Dividend ETF QDF, and then you have some uh, some secondary uh, funds around that concept. Uh, the quality dividend defensive and quality dividend dynamic. And I, 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 yes. I was wondering if you could speak to those a little bit. Uh, there's a lot going on there, different kinds of, uh, uh, of screens uh, for securities. Uh, lay, lay it out for us, and particularly as you move through it, uh, defensive versus dynamic. Uh, help, help, uh, help us think through these things a little bit, please. Well, I guess what we would start with is we think about a universe of stocks. So there is a, a parent index, uh, in this case, the Northern Trust 1250. Um, and if you were to think about that 1250, uh, um, from an informatic standpoint, it would probably be close or similar to an exposure of, say, a Russell 1000. I'm just trying to give you an, an arc of where where uh, where the, the kind of uh, uh, exposure might look like. Uh, but we have that uh, Northern Trust 1250. Uh, what we do is we identify a universe uh, of, of high dividend paying stocks, and then from those uh, stocks, when, when the way that the index is constructed uh, is we actually have a proprietary quality factor, right? It's taking the universe and dividing it up into quintiles. Uh, and so uh, the simplest way I would refer to, you know, how the process works is uh, you're removing your exposure to that lowest quintile, that fifth quintile, you're increasing your exposure to the highest quintile. So you're getting a higher quality portfolio. Uh, what uh, you see is that if you were to focus on not just uh, a high yielding uh, stocks, but that intersection of quality and yield, that over time you've gotten a superior risk adjusted return. But what you've also got is an enhanced ability to generate uh, a solid income via that portfolio, and again, remember, we come to it from the standpoint of looking at this as an income generation uh, solution. Uh, what we also thought about was the fact that as we talked to investors, that they would want some optionality. And so that core portfolio that, that you referenced, which is uh, the QDF, uh, the ticker QDF, um, it's going to approximate a, a beta of one. Uh, when you think, when I say a beta of one, I'm talking about versus uh, uh, the portfolio that we described or, or that exposure, and you know what the parent index is. But we also, uh, in, in talking to investors, knew that there were some who may want to take a more defensive posture or a more dynamic posture, i.e., uh, may want to uh, take more beta exposure or less. And so you have the ability uh, to have a dynamic portfolio um, that you, you think is somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 20 percent. Uh, uh, on the other side, uh, north uh, of a beta of one, I uh, think of 10 to 20 percent uh, uh, south on the, uh, on the defensive, so on the dynamic side, more on the defensive uh, left. And so here again, we provided some optionality so that people can have very precise tools uh, given how they want to build their portfolio. Got it. Now, there, there's a kind of a, a more general question hanging over this, this whole uh uh, new wave of um, of indexing and, and and ways to look at beta. Uh, you hear a lot of people say that uh, that the style boxes of yesteryear are 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 slowly fading, and I'm wondering if you might weigh in on that. And, and there's also a question about you know what is active and what is alpha. But let's let, let's start with uh, you know the, the style boxes of yesteryear, value and growth. Uh, in your judgment. Are these uh, style boxes sort of fading in value, or will there always be a place for them relative to what we're talking about with this uh, non-traditional indexing that seems to be gathering steam in the, in the ETF world? Well, I think it plays itself out uh, in different ways, right? So I think that uh, the construct of, 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 of the style boxes or value and growth um, play themselves out, and rightfully so, most prominently in actively managed strategies. Uh, both in terms of the, um, the definition or articulation of those strategies, the execution of those strategies. Um, when you're coming at it from an index-based approach, I think there is a different lens, at least from our standpoint. So we're looking at specific uh, factors or, or think about, you know, what we would say as risk factors. So what we want to focus on are factors that we believe over long periods of time show persistence. Uh, the, the factors that we look at where we see that persistence include size, uh, value, uh, we talked about uh, quality, we talked about uh, momentum, uh, we can talk about other things like volatility. Um, and so if, if, if in the context of that, uh, 
and then getting exposure to those factors. That's how you can efficiently do that through an index strategy. That doesn't line itself up squarely with, quote, unquote, a style box. So I, don't, I, I think while there might be some related things, they're not one and the same, Ali. Got it. And, and with regards to, to alpha, there's, there seems to be uh, some, um, some of the questions coming in uh, are uh, skeptical of the whole concept of alpha. And I'm wondering, you know, what, how much of, uh, of this beta is really poaching what alpha exists out there? How, how, would, you, how would you help us think about, you sure. know, the future of, of, of alpha seeking? I'm clearly... Uh, you know the number you laid out about indexing in in, uh, in the broadest sense. What nine percent of the investable market ten years ago you said, and now about twenty two percent. There's some skepticism about alpha seekers, alpha seeking. Um, speak to what 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 is alpha? What what's left uh, to exploit out there? Right. So it so this is an important question, but I would say answering the question uh, depends on how you're defining things. So so let me be clear on on on, on some definitional things. One, what is the benchmark you're using? Uh, two, what is the model you're using? So when we're talking about um, beta or alpha, it is always relative to some benchmark. Is your benchmark you know sort of the S&P 500? Is your benchmark you know the Russell two or three or what have you? And then you have to think about a model, right? And so are you using a traditional CAPM model? Uh, are you using, you know, uh, a, 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 a Carhartt model? And why, the reason I say that is because if you're saying that um, the, the, the market, that the model that you're using, all of the returns are largely explained by beta, and so we think of that as the first CAPM model, and then everything above that would be defined as alpha. But if you were to, uh, closer to how we think about it, to say there are other risk factors that are driving investment returns, and you start to introduce those, and, and you could argue, you could refer to them as other betas, right? At some point in time, what you have left is alpha, and that's true idiosyncratic risk. Now, the reality is it's there, it's small, it matters. Um, but that is what you what discreetly uh, describe as alpha. So it really depends on what model you're using, right? And so, again, uh, some may use a model where they're only talking about, again, uh, beta and, and referring to everything on the other side of that as the alpha or excess return. Um, from our standpoint, uh, there are other uh, risk factors that are consistently uh, generating right, uh, a portfolio return, and you have to account for those, and then whatever you have in terms of the idiosyncratic risk on the other side of that is your alpha. And so uh, what you find when you, when you do this is you can explain most of the investment returns through the various factors, and that's why these strategies present very efficient ways of actually getting exposure to returns in the marketplace. Now, I would also say this. Um, empirically, it is very hard to come by that idiosyncratic risk, but if you can see and find where it's delivered on a uh, persistent basis, it is valuable. Got it. Thank you. Uh, we have a very specific question that came in about uh, Gunner. Uh, okay. I remember when I saw it come into registration, gosh, a couple years ago, I thought that's an interesting security. It kind of spans the, uh, the entire planet, emerging and uh, developed alike. Uh, this particular question uh, refers to the indexing methodology. Do you have a top limit percentage of any particular position in your funds, uh, say BHP Billiton as an example, is shown as 5% of the Gunner portfolio? Um, can you speak to, uh, to caps uh, on the upside for particular single uh, holdings? Yeah, so, um, so the short sure answer in terms of the uh, single holdings, um, in the, the three what we call the larger sleeves, um, and those are the energy, uh, the agriculture and the metals, uh, uh, those are capped at 5%. Um, and so when it rebalances, it will rebalance back to the, um, you know, within that uh, exposure. And then on the two, quote, unquote, smaller sleeves, uh, that's where we have uh, the timber and the water. Uh, those caps are 1%. Got it. Now let's do a pullback here. I, I, I have a hard time thinking about uh, Gunner uh, without thinking about uh, your other very successful strategy, uh, which is uh, one of your tip strategies. Uh, and uh, I'm wondering if you might uh, contextualize a little bit how we should think about this. Is, it, is this like an inflation package? And you, you get a lot of ETS strategists out there these days talking about you know, putting an inflation tilt in your portfolio and, and as a core holding. Uh, 
you know, not just as some tactical, I'm, I'm worried about what the Fed's going to do next month, but over the long term, where a short-term inflation approach might be this successful fund, PDTT, uh, the Flex Shares IBOX three-year target duration tips fund, along with Gunner, which we were just speaking about with regards to the, the caps of single holdings and, that, and, and the bigger sleeves. Uh, and I'm wondering if you might uh, speak to how to think about uh, Gunner, how to think about the uh, the tip strategies. Is, it, is this a collective way? Would you counsel a kind of a core holding to, to manage inflation on an ongoing basis, or, or, or are they more tactical in nature? Uh, so from from our perspective, you know, inflation is one of the risks that is ever present. You know, it, unexpected inflation can creep up at certain times, and that may be more top of mind uh, than others. Uh, but we think um, that it's important to always have inflation uh, hedging built into a portfolio. Specific uh, to the use of tips, uh, one of the things that we've seen in terms of looking at tip strategies is when you're talking about, say, uh, shorter uh, dated tip strategies, think of things uh, kind of from the, the, the zero to five uh, uh, year range. Uh, they tend to be uh, much, uh, have a much higher correlation to CPI. It probably makes sense over that period of time having higher predictive value, so forth and so on. The other issue that you have is as you get longer in the duration of one of those securities, uh, the interest rate component of it uh, weighs more heavily. And so, uh, in short, kind of in that window of time, and so we have a three-year target and a five-year target, we find that those can be very effective tools to hedge uh, that shorter-term uh, uh, inflation risk in a portfolio. But to be very clear, we, we, we think about it from the context of hedging inflation risk. So the other, the other thing that we like about having a target duration strategy is it allows you to port the risk uh, that you have in your portfolio. Because what you can find is, uh, if you're taking too much of your duration risk in, say, a, a, a TIPS uh, a, a portfolio, you might be getting uh, an inefficient return on that risk. You might be better served porting some of that risk into a different part, say, of the fixed income market even, uh, putting it in the appropriate sort of part of the credit spectrum. So the point being, we really like the idea of using the TIPS for what we think it's best used for uh, to be uh, a good uh, inflation hedge in a portfolio. And then, with regards to Gunner, how, how do you conceptualize that holding? Is it, is it uh, has it have a, a heavy inflation focus to it, or does it really depend on how you uh, situate it in, in, in a portfolio context? Do you do you, uh, do you have a clear way of thinking about it here? So, a couple of things with Gunner. So, um, as you begin to get into uh, what we would describe as that intermediate term, uh, so think of sort of five to fifteen, five to twenty years. Uh, you have to think differently about uh, what your best uh, avenues for hedging inflation were. So we moved from a thought of, say, maybe a focus on tips to looking at something like natural resources. Um, uh, they provide uh, a very good, uh, a very solid uh, intermediate hedge. Uh, obviously, when you start thinking about the, the correlations of different asset classes, uh, they're bringing some diversification benefit uh, to the portfolio. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to do uh, with uh, Gunner was to purposely be able to get that exposure to equity securities. Uh, that matters in particular for certain types of investors, for instance, those that are tax sensitive, uh, because even if you're invested in an ETF, it depends on what structure it is. Uh, so a true 40-act fund where you're invested in equity securities is allowing you to preserve that tax efficiency. If it's in a different structure, um, say, for instance, if it was an exchange-traded note or exchange-traded commodity, uh, there are going to be some different uh, uh, tax treatments on the margin. And those are just things that, that you consider uh, when you're building out uh, these kind of solutions. And so uh, we like Gunner uh, as a hedge from that standpoint. Uh, what we also found, and this speaks to your question and the question that came up about choosing index providers to work with, you know, Morningstar uh, had a methodology uh, where they could uh, identify upstream natural resource companies, and, and by that, we were looking for companies that had a significant amount of their revenue stream uh, really tied to the actual resources. Uh, think about really getting the resources, in a sense, out of the ground, uh, because we, we, we believed, and we, we, this was proven out empirically, that they would have a much higher correlation uh, to the underlying natural resources and how they trade, so they would prove to be a, 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 good, a good hedge. Uh, so, so again, those were the things that we thought about, and again, we think about it in that intermediate term uh, as a long-term holding in a portfolio uh, that gives you a good diversification properties, uh, a strong inflation hedge, uh, and then also some appreciation potential.
Thanks, Sandron. Uh, with regards to fixed income, uh, as I said uh, early in this uh, webinar, you does put a uh, fixed income strategy into a registration that also has this uh, non-traditional indexing uh, tilt to it, looking for high quality securities, high uh, yielding, uh, low probability of default. That's what the preliminary prospectus said. I'm wondering, th this is one area of the, of, of the non-traditional indexing space, as you call it, that, that seems to have not gotten that much love. And I'm wondering if you might be able to, to, to touch on that. Clearly, you're trying to exploit an opportunity here. Why is that, that it's been uh, relatively late to the game in terms of product development here? Is there, are there some in, in, in intrinsic different, uh, difficulties there that make it harder to skin the cat or what? Yeah, I, I, well, I definitely think there are some uh, different considerations when you talk about uh, fixed income and, and, and just where we are sort of on the development life cycle. But a couple of things that I would point to with respect to fixed income. So first of all, equities, you have a, a very uh, a rich history of capturing information and data. And so when you're thinking about a quantitatively driven strategy, obviously a lot of what we're trying to do is uh, do a lot of testing, a lot of back testing, looking at um, uh, empirical analysis. And so that is very important. And so I, I think over time what we've seen is constant improvement in the ability to obtain and, 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 and clean and scrub and all those things around fixed income data. And that might seem like a small thing, but it is not. Uh, uh, another consideration is the relative uh, liquidity uh, and tradability of fixed income securities. Uh, we should be clear that for the most part, fixed income uh, is an, o I mean, it's an over-the-counter market, right? And and it, it gets increasingly illiquid as you go through different parts of it. And that hasn't gotten easier. That's gotten uh, more challenging since we've gotten on the other side of the crisis. Um, and so that's, again, not inherently bad or good, but it's one of the things that you have to account for as you're thinking about, you know, delivering strategies uh, when the underlying of what you're delivering in a tradable product is less liquid. Uh, another thing to think about with fixed income uh, securities is just the dispersion of prices. So if you think about, you know, sort of really high quality, quote unquote, fixed income securities like treasuries or even, you know, very high grade uh, securities, um, dispersion uh, of, of prices or, or price volatility is not high. Um, so that creates, uh, that movement creates less uh, opportunity. So again, all those are things that you just have to account for. Uh, there are things that are different relative to what we focused on or started with in equities. And so like anything else, over time you solve for those. So I think you'll see increased development like we already have there. It started in many of the logical parts of the market and people are getting better and smarter in terms of the approach uh, and handling some of these things that I talked about. Great. Uh, there seems to be some question about your uh, association with Northern Trust. Is it, is, is it, are, are you getting on a lot of different platforms? And I ask that question just because you are a relative newcomer. You are having success, but but are, are, are uh, can you speak to the platforms that you're available on? I think there's, there, there's some interest in your products and perhaps concern that, that, that the Northern Trust Association might create competitive challenges in terms of uh, sales and marketing. Well, well, that's an interest. I find it, it, it short, sort of interesting. I mean, I think if you look at um, the asset management space as a whole, I mean, uh, we have uh, all sorts of uh, contributors and competitors that are competing in uh, various components of the asset management space, just like us, whether it's large banks or uh, diversified financial services firms. Uh, and so one, I would say, it's not uncommon, it's common. To specifically answer the question, uh, we're engaged in all different uh, uh, types of platforms. So if you think of the, the various wealth channels, whether it be registered investment advisors, uh, independent BDs, uh, wirehouses, I mean, the places that um, certainly have shown strong receptivity to ETS broadly, um, I would say the wealth channels in particular uh, are a place that have been very strong for us. And I think much like any provider, as we have gotten a more scale in some of the products and, and, and you get more size, you also become more attractive to institutional investors, in particular um, the end markets on the institutional side uh, that are really focused on using ETFs as long-term investments. Uh, and so I said that, that, particularly, uh, that particularly is in the pension space, um, foundation and endowment certainly, and interestingly enough, uh, asset managers who are using ETFs uh, as part of uh, either managed portfolios or multi-asset class strategies. Great. Thanks uh, very much, Andron. That, uh, that wraps it up uh, in terms of the time we have available uh, today. Uh, so thus concludes our expert series webinar on ETF evolution.
emergence of non-traditional indexing. Chandran, thanks for uh, being my guest, and I also want to thank the audience for attending and also for the questions you all submitted. Um, as I said earlier, the presentation will be available to all of you uh, by the end of the weekend, uh, and you'll re receive instructions on how to get at it uh, in an email. On that note, on behalf of Chandran Thomas of FlexShares, as well as my colleagues here at ETF.com, I'm Ollie Ludwig, wishing you all a very pleasant afternoon.